actually, I have to say, I spent most of my McKinsey career, if not to say all of it, in, in Germany. Mm. And in Germany, <clears throat> I have, over the years, uh, participated not just in many uh, societal dialogues. I have written books on how Germany was doing, how they could overcome an economic crisis, which uh, was there at the early 90s. Mm. I wrote on the reunification program and so on. So uh, more and more people <coughs> in the media got interested in my biographical uh, um, history. And I had, um, I had uh, the, the number two guy at Manager Magazine who has followed me over all the years uh, come to me, plus a publisher, uh, come to me and say, you know, why don't you write your, um, your biography? And that was sort of the thing, uh, because also this thing was true, there wasn't much said about McKinsey. And, and I felt... Uh, you know, uh, there was um, there were many many things that that can and should be told about uh, the firm, uh, having been very close uh, um, to the top uh, in McKinsey. I think it's uh, it it um, it was it was in particular important uh, for uh, students for graduates to tell them what they are getting into mm -hmm. and why why uh, it's such an attractive proposition. Uh, for um, for MBAs or for uh, graduates of all sciences uh, um, to join and and you know after a couple of years find out what you want to do with your life. Mm -hmm. That that was sort of the the, the history. Mm -hmm. Now why did I then I I was quite reluctant a because McKinsey is not very open. Uh, to, uh, you know understatement perhaps. Uh, 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 yes, <laughs> but then I I found. Since I had been uh, a lot in the press, I've been on TV in Germany. It it is very natural that uh, you know things things you will get to my mountaineering club, which I have with the mm. CEOs. Uh, you will you will get to the point on, on the role I played at Bayern Munich and so on, and you will see that in many many ways bits and pieces got revealed about myself, and so I figured I might as well uh, put it together mm -hmm. in a cohesive way. I guess, you know, you would have the, do you sort of feel that, I guess, the dichotomy of, you know, how much do I give away, how much do I keep keep to yes. myself, you know? Yeah, you you probably found that I'm, I was very reluctant to talk about my kids and to talk about my, my, uh, my spouse. Uh, but uh, other than that, I think I, I gave away a lot of things which are important for, for students uh, and for executives for that matter. Uh, in addition, as you probably found out, uh, in the time right after World War II, when I had uh, um, when I got infected with tuberculosis, that was normally the time when people would say, "End of the story." Yeah. You know, you you will be doing something very very. You, you do a clerical work, or or are you worry you help in, in agriculture, and so on. And having come out of that. Um, uh, uh, disease which at that time was cured by by having you lie down uh, uh, you know, day in day out, day out. You, you were yeah. that was my 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 life i didn't do any sports uh, you know you obviously even as a as a young boy you grew in, in in size which because you don't do anything and they feed you things that you shouldn't eat and, and so on and so forth uh, so i think that example, that in itself, uh, you know, um, uh, was um, was a motivation, and I, I could tell you, David, I have several people that were that that had that had sicknesses, that had injuries, which have written to me that the book gave them gave them an idea on how you can uh, come out of the, you know, the, the overcome the hindrances uh, which are there. Mm -hmm. And what's your advice to them? Believe in yourself. <laughs> Believe in your strengths. Find out what your what what strength you have inside. Find out what your your body can give you. I'm I'm a I'm an avid health nut. So you know I'm running in the morning and I'm doing many many other sports, uh, which you can do uh, when when it becomes sort of your inner psyche. Mm -hmm. 
talking specifically about, I guess, McKinsey and the role of consultants in the business world. Now, these organizations have a massive, I think it's probably an understatement to say they have a massive influence on um, business, politics, the world in which we live. Do you think that this influence is still as strong and as, as I guess, relevant as it ever was? I think it's, it's as relevant. I think it's even getting more relevant uh, since, since McKinsey, by definition, tries uh, to quantify things which are normally not quantified, mm -hmm. i.e. the productivity differences between, between countries, between uh, economies. Uh, uh, analyzing something that they've done last year, uh, the effects of obesity uh, and the cause of obesity uh, in uh, American society. Uh, another one uh, was uh, how they analyzed uh, the the, the difference between the Russian economy and the rest of Western Europe uh, right. and, and, and gave, a, gave a very stern message that outside the oil and gas industry, outside uh, the uh, spacecraft industry, there was hardly anything that was comparable uh, to our productivity levels uh, in, in the West. Uh, so <clears throat> I think being on the forefront when it comes to think tank uh, and being independent you know we are not paid by by anybody we we are we we believe in in uh, objective analysis and 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 very often we don't have a client for that you know we the global institute which i'm sure you you have followed something that i helped to found i just was at the 25 year anniversary in paris last week is something where I was convinced that this was the role of McKinsey to tell the world, to explain uh, uh, certain trends, uh, to explain <clears throat> uh, what uh, policies uh, had which effects. And then obviously the, 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 the lion's share is working for clients. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of that. But then, you know, I suppose at the same time there is that um I guess is that impetus for, from, for change that comes from organizations like McKinsey because they take this wider worldview, not just sort of, you know, I think it's fair to say that um, consultants have been in the past criticized for going into corporates, taking an off the shelf solution and saying to the corporate world, this is what we would advise you mm -hmm. to do. It's much bigger than that, isn't it? It's looking at, you know, bigger than the economy, our whole, our whole worldview and societal views, and then sort of, you know, tailor making, I guess, a, Advice for each. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, we are free, we are believers in the market uh, mm -hmm. economy. You know, we, we we wouldn't. Although we've done uh, studies in in socialist countries, uh, uh, you know, it, it does help uh, when you have uh, the the market economy uh, theorems underlying, and that has been obviously yeah. my our our uh, mantra, uh, but. Uh, in terms of serving clients, uh, we we wanted to be tailors. We wanted to be uh, have tailor made solutions. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, often you know when when people say, "Well, you take the the solutions off the shelf and, and give them to clients," uh, it's it's a wrong assertion because clients clients have the. Uh, the sh off the shelf solutions usually within them already. Um, you know they get they get uh, uh, well groomed MBAs. They get they get people that have been around for twenty years that know how the business is being done. And in that sense, um, I think um, uh, you have to be extremely uh, extremely cautious uh, when you develop a solution with the client. And in fact, very often. We worked with the client. I was training executives of the clients, especially middle-level executives, in you know in a program that we that we had running for one to two to three years, rather than having the bang up uh, 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 solutions in in a three month study. Mm -hmm. Do you think that? Um that, that's the challenge then to sort of try and come up with these longer term sort of programs rather absolutely, than, yeah, absolutely. If, I've, I've, if I've done anything <laughs> over the years, I was convinced that in order to transform a large corporation, they needed McKinsey for a longer time period, a, a lot more intense and with a lot more training of their own people. Sometimes I said, I used the metaphor, I said, 
after we've done that program, which lasts 18 months or 24 months, you will have a McKinsey type organization within your organization because we will have trained 100, 150 of your, of your uh, second uh, level people and they will be the top executives tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that usually resonated quite well uh, with top management. I mean, um, we interviewed Paul Pullman from um, Unilever um, mm -hmm. a couple of months ago, and he was very much talking about a long-term approach to business and how, um, you know, it's it, the way that the way that I guess post two thousand and eight people think is very short term, and oh my god, we have to get the right results very quickly, and it's harder to sort of I guess groom stakeholders and shareholders to think about that long-term view. Um, you know. The, were there cases where that was a challenge where you said, yeah, we can really turn around your business, but we need a bit of time to be able to do this? Oh, obviously, we had, uh, you know, we had challenges uh, when you work in, in, the, in the utility industry mm. where you had major uh, things uh, happening overnight. All of a sudden, we decided that we do not want to have nuclear power stations anymore in Germany. If you then work with a client, you know, you better have some ideas, A, on how, you shut, how to shut down the nuclear power stations and how to move the client over time into the renewables uh, concept mm -hmm. uh, you know because you you, this, you found out that that the sun is shining and the wind is blowing and if you if you do it right uh, uh, you can have your energy supplied um, uh, through renewables how do you feel about i guess the the, the global economic environment do you feel are you, are you an optimist i'm I'm an eternal optimist. I have to, I have to say, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. Otherwise, I could not have survived uh, uh, some very, very difficult situations in clients. No, let me step back. I owe my theoretical underpinning to two uh, um, Brits. One was Adam Smith, who told us, uh, uh, you know, the, the law about free markets and. Mm. and and free time, and and and, the, and what the price uh, uh, does in order to allocate goods, and the second one was David Ricardo, who basically said the more people trade, uh, the, the wealthier they get. Uh, I, I almost took that literally as my as as my uh, as my gospel to bed at night, uh, because it's so simple, but it it is true. You know the the, the case of the English. Uh, cloth and and the Portuguese uh, wine, uh, how they how they then concentrated each one on their specialties and uh, and they become richer. And in a way, uh, I have to say our country has followed that route pretty much. After World War II, when the country was in shambles, uh, so, uh, the economy was uh, uh, destructed. Uh, we came out of that situation by becoming an export nation, mm -hmm. by saying, if we have cars that are good enough for the Germans, let's make sure we can, we can supply them to, uh, uh, we can <laughs> supply them to the rest of Europe, uh, to the United States. I remember when I came to the UK, uh, to the United States, first time in 63, that was the time when the first Beatles, VW Beatles, uh, uh, were used in, in, in the States. Mm. And they had a mileage which was 10 times as good as that of the American <laughs> gas gas. And then I said, wait a minute, you know, hey, there's a market here. And so that, that is my belief. It's, uh, you know, if, if, we, if we open trade, uh, not just of goods, but trades of, of uh, a trade in services, a trade in, in people moving moving around uh, will be wealthier. People will be more educated. You, you'll create a bigger pie mm -hmm. in the end. You'll create a bigger pie. Absolutely. And that should, Absolutely. Be, that should be the concern rather than how do we fight about distributing the pie. And that, that is a movement that we're seeing more of like collaboration versus competition Absolutely. across global markets. Absolutely. We, look, I was in, in school, David, I was told that the French are, are the arch enemies, which they were for 300 years. Yeah. <laughs> now they are the biggest trading partners uh, of, of Germany, you know, and, and we have concentrated on things that we are so much better, and the French have concentrated on consumer goods, and, and, and we are trading like crazy. So if you, and, and if politics interferes as little as possible, uh, I'm, I'm an optimist, there, there's an old saying, in, in the world when 
uh, when England was ruling the world, uh, there was a saying, the, um, the merchant follows the flag. Mm. You know, you mm. had the colonies or you had trade routes and so on. And the merchant was then saying, I'm following where the flag was put up. I think this is reversing today. Really, I think the merchant. Right. Yeah, I think the merchants are 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 creating are creating uh, the business links, uh, and 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 politics. The flags, uh, you know, are 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 moving behind. And that's how perhaps it it should be in a changing yes, economy. Yes, you know, yes. I think there is a lot. You know, obviously. Given the last sort of, you know, I guess 10 years when there's been so much volatility in economies, there has been a need for uh, governments to become very involved in business. <laughs> um, yes, yes you because they that? need the money. They need, they they, need budgets yeah. and so on. So they want to, you know, they, 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 they obviously uh, are getting involved in business. Uh, Would you like that to sort of move away, further away? Yeah. Further away, further away. <laughs> <laughs> let, let uh, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, coming from a country where, where companies like Deutsche Bank, where Siemens and VW have over the last years gone through uh, um, situations, bad uh, legal situations where people said, you know, you can't, you can't overrule them. In fact, there have been more regulations and more control and more uh, 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 tough tough uh, uh, laws on them uh, I think yes there have to be there has to be a regulation and there has to be a, a clear enforcement uh, of that but on the other hand I think just just think uh, China grew from a, 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 power, a you know a poor country into a, into a country which has now I think Five times, five times as much uh, uh, price uh, uh, per capita income than India, you know, within the last twenty-five years, mm. and only through trade. They're the largest exporting country in the world. Mm -hmm. And then, in terms of like sort of looking to the future, you know, a lot of people have made a lot of money from sort of future gazing and telling us what's going to happen. It could have been projected where China would be now, 25 years ago. Do you think it's possible to, to predict the future anymore in business? Can we plan ahead? Well, again, coming from a war-torn country for that 300 years experienced wars, mm. we now experience, then if you have peace uh, and you, for 70 years, uh, uh, we, are getting, we, we are getting wealthier, we, we, we're far better off. And, and consequently, I hope to God that we can that we come to a civil society where where we come to the belief that wars are no longer to be fought. You know, if if that let's just just imagine if that was true today or, or over the last fifty years in the Middle East, uh, you know what what things would not have happened. Mm -hmm. So if you you know if if we have a peaceful environment uh, then I think I'm I'm very bullish about things that can be done in terms of education uh, I have a, a gentleman that I know in Silicon Valley uh, Sebastian Trun he says you know we can we can uh, uh, send online courses uh, to all the African uh, um, states all they need to have is an online uh, um, uh, recipient uh, you know so I I think I'm I'm reasonably bullish, yes, about about the future. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> the thing is, you know, from from your perspective, you have you have the knowledge, the intelligence, the experience to back it up. So you know, you I, I guess you've got you're very qualified to do all these various rules. Do you think though, it's somebody who's in their twenties that's coming out of business school is in the position to say, you know, I can work in lots of organisations because they just don't have that that career experience to do it. I I think. I mean, if I can give some advice here, uh, <laughs> I, I would think, uh, 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 since I'm also following intimately the startup uh, culture uh, in, in my own country, I think it does help uh, when you follow the apprentice model. The apprentice model, as you know, I worked uh, uh, four and a half years at Shell Oil. Uh, 
and I I learned everything, you know, from 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 being the message boy for a couple of weeks, from working on the gas stations, from doing anything. And and then I, at, at McKinsey, the same thing is, you know, you you work up the trenches. Mm. Uh, I think I think it it has a benefit in in finding out how. Uh, society ticks, how the economy ticks, uh, uh, what it means to have a paycheck at the end of the month uh, uh, and and make your ends uh, uh, your, uh, be dictated by the means you have. I think that, that does help. Mm. Uh, and I've seen all too many startups who fail uh, because people didn't have the basic business understanding. Yeah, you can wake up one morning and you become uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Well, hell no. It's a, you know a reality. <laughs> Probably there are thousands of thinking that, but there's only one Zuckerberg. You're right. Yeah. So talking a little bit about what you're doing now. So you're obviously very much involved in the sports industry, in politics, in banking and finance. How how does that? How do you sort of bring all that together? How do you you know? Do you have to sort of switch into a different mindset for each industry you're working with? Well, in? first of all, I I think over time. Uh, and over my years in McKinsey, I learned that management is in many, many ways the discerning factor. Uh, that could be for a football club, that could be uh, for, uh, obviously, for a corporation, that could be in a political party, that can be in, in, uh, in the church uh, where I'm currently involved, you know, that, that can be in, in, in a union. The, the discerning factor is M. Management and and here I say, I learned something about management, and I can I can probably not just give advice, but also uh, uh, implement some of the ideas. Uh, so hence, I have um, a number of startups where I'm involved in uh, as an investor, as business angel. I'm involved in an FC Bayern Munich, uh, and 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 so on. And and the management dimension, David, has a lot of similarities. A lot of similarities in in thinking hard about your strategy find out what you're good at and, and what works and what doesn't and then implementing it doggedly finding out that operations is not something uh, where you have grease under your fingernails but where you, where you actually have a, a clear understanding about input and output and and if you are uh, not productive uh, you know uh, the economy will take care of it and you, you'll get out of business. So that I have found is something that can be implemented uh, almost in all of these situations. And if you, I, I, was, <clears throat> I, I was born and, and reared near Stuttgart. Now Stuttgart is known for Daimler because they invented the car, Mercedes, Bosch, Bosch and so on. But it's also known, it used to have a football club VfB Stuttgart, which was eight years ago champion of the German uh, league. They just went down. They were relegated to the second. And it's only one factor. It's management. They bought lousy players. They made lousy extensions of... of uh, they, 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 they got three coaches, three managers a year and so on. In the end, they went down. So it was predictable. And take the other one. Take Bayern Munich. I think the discerning factor is that we have a very good management team, excellent management team over many years. And, and, we, and we used to have, I don't know how it's here, but we used to be about, in, in terms of sales, annual sales, we used to about, we'd be about 10% better than Dortmund. Now we're twice as big. You know, if, uh, in things like, if you're twice as big, you can buy better players. You can buy, you, you can do many, many more things. Uh, you get money from the, from the uh, Champions League, although we didn't win it. <laughs> no, that, I think that's a very interesting point. Yeah. So, I mean, so then, I mean, I guess you're saying that fundamentally management of, of any sort of sector, industry, walk of life is what yeah, strategy is applicable everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. That's why you have, that's why you have so many people who were uh, very good at management in one company. We now have a good friend of mine. He used to be at HP. Then he used to be at Henkel. Now he will be the CEO of Adidas. But he's the CEO, you know, he's a very good manager, an excellent manager. Mm. I mean, I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, 
that there's a lot of theory behind this that you know lots of some academics would argue that management is a skill that's transferable you can take it to any sector some would say no you can't do that you know if you're experienced as being um, you know working in FMCG you'll always mm -hmm. have to work in FMCG but I'm glad you think that that's you know a transferable. no I think it's transferable yeah. and because also if you are if you are a reasonably modest manager you will find out you can't do it all on your own you need a team uh, mm. so you will be building a team from day one in in any uh, situation if you don't have a team around you that understands you that helps you that that, that goes through the trenches with you uh, you might as well forget it i i think uh, i i followed check well she was the super manager uh, at uh, general electric i was Jack was always positioned as being the solo performer, uh, you know, without Jack, uh, GE wouldn't be where it was, which is probably true. But Jack Welch had a team around him who were aficionados, you know, mm -hmm. who, who, who praised him and, and, and so on. So he, he, he literally institutionalized a culture where people were thinking like he was thinking. And, 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 and so in the end, you know, uh, while he was a very young, I think he was 42 when he became G, uh, head of GE, he was magnificent in, in, in shaping a culture and, and then creating a team, management team. Yeah. Which moves me on to, to um, one of my last questions. Now, our readers are going to be very much saying, well, what is Herbert's view of how I can get a job at McKinsey? What's the leader of the future look like and how can I be that? So. I'd be interested to find out from you what you think are the qualities that are going to really differentiate great leaders from good leaders in the future. I think the the textbooks have become similar, whether you whether you are uh, in in the states or in England or in Germany. So and and you and the analytics are also similar. Uh, we live in a quantitative world. So assume that uh, the necessary condition at the, that you are reasonably strong in analytics, that I, I joked about it, that you have to be able to subtract and add and occasionally multiply and divide. Uh, but <laughs> other than, I think in today's world, the social dimension has become much more important. Mm. If, I had to, if I had to say, what is, what is the sufficient condition then it is the, the uh, 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 not, not the sufficient, that the, how is it called, the necessary condition, then it is the social that dimension. You do, do I have people that I can send to a client, that can listen to a client, that can work with the client, that can say, I'm helping you in a catalytic, a catalytic way, uh, uh, and so on. Are they, are, are, you know, are, is the client seeing them as advisors, as somebody who's help, uh, who's creating a solution to the problem, or is he adding to the problems? Mm -hmm. That would be my, that would be, and, and I, so I would always assume that people that you can see it by the grades they have in, in mint subjects and so on. But then I would always say, you know, do I want to work with that person for six months in a faraway place where I, where I have to be with him Monday through Thursday? And so that's, that's basically it. <laughs>